guys can go ahead and have a seat. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Acts chapter 10. That's where we're going to be hanging out today as we continue in our series entitled The Church here in the New Testament. Hey, real quick, quick, can we give it up for all of our new guests today? I am proud of you. You did it. You braved the frozen tundra that is Southeast Texas. You survived. You made it to church. I know most of you guys are used to Pastor Byron being here, um, bringing the fire of God so we can all warm up a little bit, right? And you're looking up here and you're like, who is this guy? Is he going to rob me? (laughs) Why does he look like a youth pastor from 2008? (laughs) Is he going to ask me to borrow $40? No. My name is Trevor Knox. I have the honor and privilege of serving here on staff as our executive ministry director where I help oversee all Sunday operations. That means anything that goes down on a Sunday is my responsibility, which means if you ever have a complaint or anything like that, you can always email me at Ethan Berwick at RedemptionTX.com. And uh, we will get right back to you. I promise you. I promise you. But hey, here's all you need to know about me. Five years ago, I was saved in this church. I was baptized in this church. I was engaged in this church. I was married in this church. I was divorced in this church. No, I'm kidding. We aren't that kind of church. My wife has not left me yet. Praise God. Hallelujah. But I've been serving here at Redemption since 2018. And since that time, a lot of things have changed. Hey, who has been here since the beginning? Let me see a show of hands. There we go. We have three of you. You made it. (laughs) We will survive. A dying breed. But uh, our church has come a long way. We used to do church in an old dirty bar on Crockett Street right down the road. You guys remember that? It was me and 80 other psychos who would wake up at 6 a.m. at this bar to help set up and tear down. Back then, our serve teams were uh, one guy with a sign on the wrong side of the road. We had one girl with one coffee pot because that's all we could afford. And we had one guy who would ask for people's phone numbers, thinking it was like a connect card, but it wasn't. That guy does not go here anymore. Okay, he's not here anymore. For example, when I first started coming here, uh, my best friend and a fellow staff member, our, uh, Ethan Burwick, he's our executive director of operations. This is what he looked like when I met him. Look at this guy. Dude, I was best friend with Johnny Depp. This is Ethan now. As you can see, ministry is easy on the mind and soul. So church looks a little different than it used to back then. Amen? It looks a little different. But we have stayed faithful to the vision ever since day one. Okay? The building looks different. A lot of the people are different. But our mission and our vision has always stayed the same, amen? It didn't matter what building we're in, okay? We're here now, and we love to celebrate what God is doing here, amen? Even with the leaks. New building coming soon. Shout out to Multiply. So if you are newer here, I want to explain everything that Redemption Church stands for, and you can find it here in our vision statement. What's cool is that's what we're going to be uh, learning about today in Acts, okay? It applies directly to our vision statement, and that is this. We exist to see a gospel-centered movement in the heart of the city where every man, woman, and child can experience life change through Jesus. Amen. So some people have left, but the vision has stayed the same. The building might be different, but the mission has stayed the same. Ethan's hair is shorter, but he still looks good. And our purpose has not changed. We exist to see a gospel-centered movement in the heart of the city where every man, woman, and child can experience a life change through Jesus. And if you're wondering where we got that from, okay, we didn't just make it up, okay, it was inspired from the Bible. Now, it is kind of long, okay, I've been around the country learning from other churches, helping coach other church planters, and uh, they always say, when you make a vision statement for a church, make it short, make it simple, make it catchy, okay, easy to remember, and we're like, here's a paragraph, (laughs) right? It's not catchy, it doesn't have like a cool jingle, because it would sound bad. We exist to see a gospel center movement, no, it doesn't work, it's not catchy, it's not the Kit Kat song, right? But as we read today, I want you guys to, to, to uh, put our vision statement through the filter of the, of the words we're going to go through today in the book of Acts. Okay, and I really want you to focus and put an emphasis on this word, every. 
We exist to see a gospel-centered movement in the heart of the city where every man, woman, and child can experience life change through Jesus. So let me ask some questions. Every man, woman, and child can experience life change through Jesus. Do you believe that God wants everyone to come to know and love Jesus? Do you believe that God wants everyone to be forgiven of sin? Do you believe that God wants everyone to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Do you believe that God wants everyone to be saved and baptized? Do you believe that God wants anyone and everyone to experience life changed through Jesus? Or does every really mean some? Do you believe that life changes for everyone or only some? Because what we see quite often today in the church is while people may say life change for everyone, they really mean some. They have some hidden reservations deep down they don't want to talk about. Okay, life change for everyone. Unless you're an Eagles fan, you're gross. Life change for everyone. Unless you're a vegan, you're annoying. <laughs> life change for everyone. Unless you're a Democrat, you're evil. <laughs> life change for everyone, except my ex who cheated on me. It gets tougher as you start going down the line of what everyone actually means. Okay? And if that makes you a little uncomfortable, let me read a. Uh, Verse 42, we just kind of break, da- break it down what it means ahead of time. It says that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. So everyone doesn't mean some. It means all, not almost. It means anyone and everyone, no matter who, what, when, where, or why, is welcome, <laughs> invited, and can be changed. Everyone means everyone, not just some. So when we say every man, woman, and child, do we truly mean every? Or do we mean some? Like what about the people who hurt you? What about the people we have trouble forgiving? What about the people who don't look like you? What kind of church are we called to be? And what kind of church are we willing to be? So let's jump back into Acts as we read, in my opinion, I think you'll agree, one of the most important chapters in all of the Bible. We're going to be reading about two characters and four big ideas that help us shape the kind of church we're called to be. Our title today is answering the question, what role do we play as a church? And answering the question, can Jesus save anyone. So now as a heads up here at Redemption, we love the Bible. Amen. Amen. We live under this word. We believe it is infallible. It is inerrant. Okay. We follow the Bible. So get your reading glasses ready because it's a lot of Bible. We're going to go through an entire chapter today and uh, I'm super excited to share it with you guys. So in the, in this chapter, we're going to meet two men who up until this point, up until this point, believe that life change for everyone really meant life change for some. We meet Cornelius, who's a Roman Gentile, who according to his background and the culture he came from was far from God and unworthy. But we also interact with Peter, who is a devout Jew and one of Jesus' disciples who was chosen by God. So starting out, both men believed that everyone only meant some. And then God did what? The impossible. He did the unthinkable and he did the unimaginable. Let's read. So verse one, at Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius a centurion of what was known as the Italian cohort, a devout man who feared God with all his household, gave alms generously to the people and prayed continually to God. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God come in and say to him, Cornelius, and he stared at him in terror, which is the right reaction, right? That's terrifying. And he said, what is it, Lord? And he said to him, your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and bring one Simon who is called Peter. He is lodging with one Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had departed, he called two of his servants and a devout soldier from among those who attended him. And having relayed everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. So here we meet Cornelius. He's a man from Caesarea who is a Gentile. For those who don't know but have read this word a lot when you're reading your Bible, this means he is not Jewish. So raise your hand if you are not Jewish. Congrats, you're a Gentile. This verse is for you. Unless you didn't raise your hand, shout out to you. I'm glad you're here as well. So we have the Jewish people who are chosen and selected by God, and then you have us, everyone else, the Gentiles. Now Cornelius as a Gentile means he was not raised in church. He did not know the word of God. He didn't have the ability to worship the God of the Bible. He did not yet know who Jesus was. He was from Caesarea, where he served as a centurion from the Italian cohort. So this means like he was uh, a high-ranking military official. 
who was on duty around the Jewish people, so he got to know the Jewish people. But from his culture, the Romans, they would actually worship their king as a god. Okay, so they were from a completely different background, completely different culture, worshiping false idols. That was, this is where uh, Cornelius came from. But Scripture says that Cornelius is a devout man who feared God with all his household, gave alms generously to the people, and prayed continually to God. So Cornelius could be looked at similar, if you remember a few chapters back, to the way the, uh, the eunuch was. Okay, this is a man who is far from God, but he wants to know who God is. Okay, he's hungry to learn about God, but he doesn't have the ability to do so. Because of his background, because of his culture he came from, because of his ethnicity, he was not allowed to openly practice this faith. And we see this today where Cornelius wants to follow Jesus fully, but he isn't able to. He doesn't have a mentor. He doesn't have a church to go to. He doesn't have a small group to meet at. He doesn't have a serve team to serve with. He doesn't have resources to fall back on. He is willing, but he's not yet able. That's point number one. Some are willing, but not able. There are some people who want to live the right life. They want to give generously. They want to share their faith with others, but they don't have the foundation to build upon. There are people in our lives that want to give this God thing a chance, but they don't know how. Maybe they are willing, but they're not yet able. I think sometimes we get caught up in the life of the church that sometimes we forget what life was like without the church. Do you guys remember what it was like without the church? Some of you don't. Some of you were raised right, right? Some of you were, were little. When, you, you, were in church, when you, were, you were little and in church at the same time, you grew up in church. That's been your life. Your testimony is boring. Hallelujah. <laughs> hey, we love boring testimonies. Amen? Amen. Come, we want our children to have boring testimonies. Amen? Come on. Oh, there are also people in our lives that didn't get to raise, they, they weren't raised in this, this culture. They weren't raised in church. They didn't know who God was. But there is a desire within their hearts to learn who God is. And you would be surprised in your life who those people are. Do you remember when you didn't hear the word of God preached every week? Do you remember when worship was just music to you? Do you remember when you didn't have people walking beside you to help strengthen your faith? I do. It was only six years ago. Six years ago, I was an anti-disciple, not raised in church, uh, very much an atheist and an outspoken atheist. I was very in your face, zero respect given. And any time I would argue with a Christian, they would either just walk away or they'd be like, hey, good luck in hell. Okay, these are my experiences with Christians growing up. And then my wife, who was my girlfriend at the time, started going to church and over a year I saw all this change in her happening. She started reading her Bible. We didn't even have a Bible. She started hanging out with friends who would actually encourage her. That was new, positive influences. Not the life that uh, I was used to, okay? And then by circumstance, one day, I end up at the same church. Okay, I've hit rock bottom. I, really, I take my girlfriend off and I'm trying to make it up to her. I'm like, yeah, I'll go to church. I show up to church and what do I see everywhere? All over the shirts, all over the walls, all over the logos. Every man, woman, and child can experience life change through Jesus. Not me. I'm middle fingers to the sky. I did not put my fingers up, just so you guys know. <laughs> Replay. Okay. I'm already wearing a beanie. There's only so much I can get away with up here, all right? <laughs> but not me. I had literally convinced some of my friends that God was not real. I was an anti-disciple. Not me. I was consumed with violence and rage. I, I romanticized my depression and lived in victimhood and would hold that over people's heads because of the trauma that I experienced whenever I was being raised. My father passing away at a young age, my little brother being in a uh, traumatic car wreck where he had permanent brain damage. My mother who had to raise us alone in poverty. My older brother who was my mentor got thrown in prison for almost killing a guy. Okay, I had, I'd given up on any chance that not only God was real, but that he cared about me. And then suddenly, God reached into my chest. He ripped my heart out. He gave me a new heart. He gave me eyes to see people that I, can actually, that I need to love. He gave me ears to hear his voice in a way that I could not deny. So suddenly, I was willing 
I was willing. I was so on fire, but I was not yet able because I didn't have the vision. I needed direction. I needed a church that actually meant it when they said every man, woman, and child can experience life change through Jesus. Guys, Pastor Byron hated me. He hated me. I mean, he won't tell you that. I will. He's watching online. I'm sorry. Uh, I was, think about it. I was the atheist boyfriend who started coming with this newly saved girl, right? This girl was vulnerable. This girl was vulnerable. And then here I come stomping along, ready to make fun of this stuff, ready to deny this stuff. But God made sure that uh, <laughs> my pride was not going to get in the way. Okay, he changed me. He changed me. But what made me be put in a position where I could actually learn and grow from this it was from you guys. It was from being around the right people. It was from being in a place that meant it when they said every man, woman, and child can experience life change through Jesus. We have to understand that as a church, God makes a pathway. God uses us, the church, to make a pathway for his people. Yes. It's us. There are people in our lives that are willing but not yet able. And we have to realize that we as a church are the bridge that helps others experience this life change. So are you willing to do that? Because unfortunately, there are also people in the church who are able, but they're not willing to reach them. Let's continue. So point number two, some are able but not willing. The next day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the house top about the sixth hour to pray. And he became hungry and wanted something to eat. But, that were, but while they were preparing, he fell into a trance. So now we have Peter, a disciple of Jesus, who appears to be so hungry, he passes out. This is me on this 21 days of prayer and fasting. <laughs> and saw the heavens opened up and something like a great sheet descending, being let down by its four corners upon the earth. In it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And there came a voice to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, by no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice came to him again a second time. What God has made clean, do not call uncommon. This is very important. This happened three times, and the thing was taken up at once to heaven. So now this, this first part of Peter's experience sounds a lot like me uh, pre-life change through Jesus, right? I'm in the jack-in-the-box drive through I'm on a substance I should not be on. I'm tripping. I'm like, whoa, a lizard. That is not what's happening here. Okay, Peter is having a vision from God. Peter is having a vision from God. He sees every animal you can imagine, and God says, kill and eat. Why would he say that? Because Peter is Jewish, and according to Jewish law at this point, there are animals and foods that are considered unclean, and they actually weren't allowed to eat these. In the Old Testament, there was a big list of certain foods that a person couldn't eat because they were defiled animals and eating these foods would make one ceremonial unclean and it would actually prevent them from worshiping God and being around God's people. So at this time, if you were Jewish, I hope you love God more than you love crawfish because the boil ain't happening. But don't worry, Jesus is on the way. I felt all of y'all's hearts drop. <laughs> Peter, being a devout Jew, had never touched, killed, or eaten an unclean animal. But God says, what I have made clean, do not call uncommon. Let's continue. Now, while Peter was inwardly perplexed as to what the vision that he had seen might mean, behold, the men who were sent by Cornelius, having made inquiry for Simon's house, stood at the gate and called out to ask whether Simon, who was called Peter, was lodging there. And while Peter was pondering the vision, the spirit said to him, behold, three men are looking for you. Rise <clears throat> and go down and, ac and accompany them without hesitation, for I have sent them without hesitation. And Peter went down to the men and said, I am the one you are looking for. What is the reason for your coming? And they said, Cornelius is a centurion, an upright and God-fearing man who was well spoken of by the whole Jewish nation, was directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and to hear what you have to say. So I want you to notice the wording in verses 13 and verse 20. Rise, kill, and eat. And then rise and go down and join them without hesitation. <clears throat> for Jewish people, eating was more than just a meal. It was a symbolic act of friendship. It was a part of uh, Jewish tradition because God wanted them to be separate from the rest of the world and to be holy and upright before him. Then the spirit says, rise and go down and accompany them. Do you see the connection that God is making here? He's not just talking about unclean animals. He's talking about unclean people. But what does Peter say at first? No way, Lord. I ain't doing that. That's not what we do. We are Jewish. I ain't touching that lizard. 
So God had to tell him, what, three times before he got the message. Because for some reason, Peter always defies God three times in a row. It's his thing. Every, everything Peter does is always in threes. Why? Because Peter is forgetful. And sometimes we all need reminders before uh, we actually get what God is telling us. Amen? Do you know how many times my wife has to ask me to take the clothes out of the dryer? Three. Because as a leader of the house, I keep it biblical. Now, Cornelius, a Gentile, not Jewish, receives the same thing, a vision from God, and he's told to go find Peter. But Cornelius, on the first time, says, got it, boss, first time, on my way. So Cornelius, the Gentile, was more willing than the believer because Peter is able, but at first he was not willing. Some are able, but not willing. Some people in the church today are able, but not yet willing. Peter knows who Jesus is. He spent three years, again, three, walking with Jesus. He was the first disciple, the leader of the apostles. He knew Jesus better than anyone else. And if anyone should have remembered the willingness of Jesus, it should have been Peter, right? Jesus would constantly stand up against the Pharisees. Peter, do you remember that? Peter, do you remember when Jesus walked right up to the leper and healed him? Do you remember when Jesus sat with sinners? Do you remember when Jesus had a Bible study with a man possessed by 10,000 demons? As Redemption Youth would say, Peter, why are you capping? I'm so sorry for that. <laughs> but like I said before, we can be way more like Peter than we care to admit, right? We read the stories about Jesus, but we fail to love our neighbor. We read the stories about Jesus hanging out with outcasts, then we make people feel like they don't belong. We read the stories of Jesus breaking boundaries, and we still choose to stay comfortable. Because we have to admit, and it's okay to admit, but it's easy to love Jesus. It's difficult to love like Jesus. Oh, it's easy to love the comfort and the peace and the direction that comes with following Jesus. But as soon as we see someone who doesn't look like us, we put God in a box and labels on other people. But not my church, right? Not my church. Okay, look, I have a huge blessing, and I am aware of this, that redemption is the only church I've ever called home. You guys heard it. Right? I was saved in the church, divorced, saved in the church, married in the church, <laughs> baptized in the church. This is the only church I've ever known, okay? And uh, it breaks my heart when I hear other people coming from other churches, and they have to tell me about their abusive past. They have to tell me about scandals and church hurt and abuse. And I feel so thankful that God put me here and I haven't had to experience any of that. But I also distinctly remember being here a couple years ago, and there was this uh, older man who was a regular attender, and he served. He was faithful. He was very nice to talk to. And when I looked at him, I would say goals. This is who I want to be like whenever I grow up. This is who I want to be like when I grow up. Mind you, I was 31. But this is who I want to be like when I grow up because he was following the Bible. He was a man of God. He led his family well. He led a Bible study with young men. And I'm like, this guy is goals. But then on this Sunday morning, one, one day, a, a person walks through our doors, and let's just say they were outwardly not, they, did, they didn't come off as biblically aligning, okay? Their lifestyle was very obviously not of the Bible. Their lifestyle was very not Christian. And I'm standing next to this older man, the guy I look up to, and he says, who let that thing in here? Even if he meant it as a joke, he said, who let that thing in here? And I'm just like, hey. Do we follow the same book? The book I'm reading tells me to meet people where they're at, not where I want them to be. The book I'm reading says God meets us where we are at, right? If we, if, if we want to see people get to where God wants them to be, okay, is this how we can treat them? Is this the way we need to talk to people, talk about people? Is this the approach as Christians we should judge others as they are walking through our doors? It broke my heart. But if we're not willing to meet people where they're at, what makes you think they'll ever get where God wants them to be? We're all prone to this way of thinking, but if we really believe life changes for everyone, are we willing to let the homeless person join our small group? It's hard to love like Jesus. Are we willing to walk with people and model what a follower of Jesus is supposed to look like? We are able, but are we willing what has Jesus proved over and over to us as believers? That he is what? Both willing and able. Amen. He is both willing and able. Point number three. The verse continues. So he invited them 
in to be his guest. The next day he rose and went away with them, and some of his brothers from Joppa accompanied him. So now Peter, who's convicted of his unwillingness, is learning his lesson. He meets Cornelius' servants, <clears throat> and the next morning he and the others go with him to make a day-long journey from Joppa to Caesarea. And on the following day, they entered Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called them together, his relatives and close friends. So now it's a packed house. All of his family is here. All of his friends are here. Why? Because they are willing. Verse 25, when Peter entered, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshiped him. But Peter lifted him up saying, stand up, I too am man. And as he talked with them, he went in and found, as many, found many persons gathered. And he said to them, you yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or to visit anyone of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. This is where Jesus is about to flip another table. He's about to change the way people see each other forever. He's about to break every boundary that separates us from him and us from each other. Verse 29, so when I was sent for, I came without objection. I asked why you sent for me. And Cornelius said, four days ago, about this hour, I was praying in my house at the ninth hour. And behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard and your alms have been remembered before God. Send therefore to Joppa and ask for Simon, who is called Peter. He is lodging in the house of Simon, a tanner by the sea. So I sent for you at once and you have been kind enough to come. Now, therefore, we are all here in presence, in the presence of God to hear all that you have been commanded by the Lord. So now Peter is living every preacher's dream. He has an audience who are hungry and desperate for the word of God, just like us, amen? amen? They're looking for hope. They are looking for healing. They are seeking the truth. They are hanging on to every word that Peter is about to preach. They are leaning in, and this is entirely new for Peter because up to this point, he had been accused of being drunk. He had been thrown in prison. One of his deacons was murdered for preaching, and now he's surrounded in Rome by people that he's not allowed to be around, but they are hungry for the word of God. They were seen as unclean, and now he gets to preach a sermon he never thought was possible. It continues. So Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly, I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. As for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. You yourself know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee, after the baptism that John proclaimed. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with, Holy, with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and made him to appear. Not to all the people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to, to judge the living and the dead. To him, all the prophets bear witness. And everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. So Peter preaches. And what is sermon actually about? Jesus. Peter learns his lesson and does exactly what he was supposed to do. He preaches the gospel. Jesus is the Lord of all. Who is Jesus for? Everyone who's willing. He shows no partiality. Whose sins can be forgiven? Everyone's. Who will judge the living and the dead? Jesus. It's always only and all because of Jesus that life change can happen. Hallelujah. That's all you have to say. It's because of Jesus that we are called to follow the love of God. It's because of Jesus that life change is available now for everyone. Jesus loves the unlovable. He welcomes the unwelcomed. He repairs the broken. He heals the damaged because Jesus is willing and he is able. And because he has already set the model for us to follow. So while Peter was skeptical, Jesus went forward. Where Peter was unwilling, unwilling, Jesus was willing. Where Peter had fear, Jesus had faith. Peter couldn't fathom a person from another nation getting saved. Jesus made a way. And what he did back then, he's still doing right now. Amen. So as a church, are we willing to make a way for everyone to experience life change? Yes. The next part should fire you up then. <laughs> Verse 44, while Peter was still saying these things, what happens? The Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word, even the Gentiles. While Peter is preaching, the Holy Spirit says, okay, Peter, you took care of the natural. I'll take it from here. 
And the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. For they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. We've said it before and we'll say it again, redemption. When we are faithful to do the natural, God is faithful to do the supernatural. Amen? Amen. Jesus is willing and able, and this means that life change is available for everyone. Are you old? Are you young? Are you black? Are you white? Are you gay? Are you straight? Are you an addiction? Do you live with doubt? Are you a Democrat? Are you a Republican? Do you like pineapple on your pizza? Yes. <laughs> Guess what? Repent and believe because life change through Jesus is for everyone. There's not a single person walking on this earth who is too far gone from the love of Jesus. And the question for us as a church is, what are we going to do about it? If we are faithful to the natural, God will be faithful to do the supernatural. The word finishes by saying, then Peter declared, can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to remain for some days. <clears throat> so we started with the Gentile Cornelius who was willing, but he was not able. And then we have Peter, who should have been willing because he was able, but God had to teach him a lesson. And this all comes from Jesus, who has always been willing and able. So point number four, redemption, the church is both willing and able. My friends, we, the church, must be willing and able to welcome every man, woman, and child so they can experience the same life change we have. This is a culture that Jesus has called us to build at redemption. While I was writing the sermon, I was wrestling all week with the direction this text needs to go. So whenever you're writing a message, a lot of times it's important to throw in an illustration, right? So you guys can relate to it, and I'm not boring you. <laughs> little peek behind the scenes. And I'm like, God, I need, I need something. I can't just tell the same stories every time I preach. What's, what's going to happen? So while we were here on Wednesday night, we had our deeper discipleship event. Anybody there? <laughs> Shout out. There we go. And as we were leaving, there was a lady crying in the lobby. Welcome to Redemption. This is what we do. We show up, we learn, we worship, we cry, we leave, right? So this, this young lady is crying in the lobby. So me and another leader, we pull her to the sanctuary to, to hear her out. We want to connect with her. We want to talk to her, see, see where this pain's coming from. It turns out she was crying tears of joy. She said, I've never been a part of a place that actually cares about me without even knowing me. I've never been a part of a place that is actually encouraging me without even knowing me. You guys are too friendly. What is this? This is too good to be true. <laughs> Guess what? Sometimes Jesus seems like he's too good to be true, yes. right? That's all I could tell her. I said, hey, you're just in the right place. This is, this is who God calls us to be. This is the culture that God has called us to build here at Redemption, and you are always welcome, okay? And this is a place you are safe. You're going to be able to learn. You're going to find a foundation of friends and people who are going to walk alongside you to help strengthen your faith. You've come to the right place. Amen? Amen. Amen. So the story is Cornelius being willing but not yet able. It's Peter learning that he has to be willing where God has called him able. The story is Jesus being willing and able to make a way for everyone to experience life change through him. This story is what redemption will always stand for. It doesn't matter what the building looks like. It doesn't matter who's preaching behind the pulpit. I'm not going to rob you. It doesn't matter what songs we play during worship, but you guys do great. Thank you, Jason. That's the look he always gives me. We exist to see a gospel-centered movement in the heart of the city where every man, woman, and child can experience life change through Jesus. When we say every, we have the faith to fight for it. Amen? The church isn't a museum for old white dudes who are stuck in the 1980s. But we love our old white dudes, okay? I plan on being one one day. Come on. But no, this church it is a training ground for the saints. Bert almost came off his seat at me. No, no, I'm, t- I'm telling you. The church is a training ground for the saints, and it's also a hospital for the broken. Can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? The church is for everyone who is willing to walk through these doors and submit themselves to the way that Jesus teaches us to live. I've literally had someone ask me, do y'all just let anybody in here? Yes. 
but I, I, I saw an usher smoking a cigarette around the corner. You should have seen what they were smoking last year. When I, when I first walked into these doors, guys, I was depressed, I was broken, I was on the brink of taking my own life. I came very, 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 very close. But God made a way where I ended up in this dirty old bar and I would sit there listening to stuff I did not believe in. But then this guy with long blonde hair would always come and sit right next to me. You can take that down, I don't need that. They get it. But he would come and sit next to me. And then I would come back the next week, he'd sit by me. I'd come back the next week, he'd sit by me. I'd come back the next week, he'd sit by me. I've been I'm like, dude, what do you want? But over time, God gave me a new life. And the person that kept sitting next to me became a friend and that friendship became discipleship. That discipleship became servanthood. That servanthood led into a life that I could have never dreamed of and a revelation that I'm not meant to do this life alone. So when I first started serving, I was working three jobs, but I made sure I was here every single Sunday for every service we had to serve out there in that parking lot, rain, sleet, or snow with a sign, because I knew at any chance, somebody walking through these doors, their life could change forever. Because he did it for me, he can do it for them. I'm not special. So holding that sign out in the parking lot while it's 32 degrees, I love you guys, had a purpose. It never, it was never hard for me because I knew at any chance somebody's life could change forever because I had news to tell them. I was like, hey, I have hope now. Did you guys know hope is real? Did you guys, you know, you don't have to walk alone? Did you guys know that this life isn't as hard as you're making it out to be because we serve a God who created us, who is willing to walk with us through every up and down? I'm here to tell you, I'm waving the sign. I'm not special. Come and see. Come and see. You're addicted to drugs. Come sit next to me. You're struggling with your identity. Come sit next to me. Your marriage is in shambles. Come sit next to me. You think you're broken beyond repair? Come sit next to me. Because let me tell you about a man who has already forgiven you. Let me tell you about the spirit that will empower you to make the right choices for you and your family. Let me tell you about the God who won't turn away, the God who will not fix you because he doesn't just fix people. He brings dead things to life. I've seen it. I felt it. I'm not special. I'm just a dude who had nothing and was gifted everything. God didn't fix me. He made me new. When we say life change for everyone, we mean everyone. Because until you are in Christ Jesus, you are dead in your sins. And Jesus himself said, come to me all who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. He didn't say some. He said all. He's not just talking about you. He's not just talking about me. He's talking about everyone because Everyone is welcome and anyone can change. I don't care how far you are from God. I don't think how broken you think you are. Everyone is welcome and anyone can change. So who are we? Are we Peter or are we Cornelius? Are we willing and are we able to welcome everyone who wants to pursue Jesus? Well, some of you in this room may feel like Peter. Remember, just because Peter denied God in the beginning, the beginning, God used that to teach Peter that once again, his way is the right way. And it's available for everyone. It's okay to fail as long as we learn from it because what Peter had to learn would change the course of human history forever. That's why we're in this room. It's because this sermon happened. Everyone is welcome and anyone can change. Who does Jesus welcome into partnership with him? Everyone. Who is too far gone from the life-changing power of the gospel? Nobody. Because everyone is welcome and anyone can change. There are no labels in the kingdom of heaven. There are no boundaries for who can follow Jesus. When Jesus sets the standard, he always raises the bar. That's who he is, which means that who we are called to be. Jesus can save anyone because everyone is welcome and anyone can change. So help me out. We exist to see a gospel-centered movement in the heart of the city where every man, woman, and child can experience life change through Jesus. 
That's who we are. That's who we will always be. At the bar down the road, in this house with leaky roofs, in our new building that's going to welcome so many new disciples and help change Southeast Texas forever, that's who we are. So let's continue to have the faith to fight for it. Amen.